You ever step on something that wasn't sure? Maybe on a brace or on a ladder or something. I don't speak about ladders around Pastor Manny too much. He gets nervous. But uh, if you've ever been unsteady on your feet or you've been unbalanced or you've been on a rock or something and, you know, it's the, 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 the footing is not sure, it can it kind of get a little nervous. You kind of get a little shaky because you don't know what's happening. But when you're on a sure foundation, when you're on something solid, you don't have to have any worries. And I feel that the church of Jesus Christ today, the way that it's heading in America, is heading on very shaky ground. Some of the things that they're teaching and preaching, that's why my wife, we were talking to somebody the other day, we said, we don't watch Christian television. Uh, for one reason, one reason only, we, we, number one, we don't want to be critical. But number two, I don't want to be influenced by the garbage that's out there. Now, if you want <clears throat> some good, solid Christian teaching, come to me. I, got, I can give you thousands of recommendations of who to read, some of the great men of God, some of the great women of God that wrote books that have substance and meaning to it. They didn't write the book to make a lot of money. They wrote the book to help the body of Christ. Today, it's become just a cycle of money making. And so um, the cornerstone... <clears throat> a sure foundation. I want to open up with an introduction this morning, and I hope I have time. In Psalm verse, uh, Psalm chapter eleven, verse three. I, I <clears throat> excuse me. I don't know what's happening in my voice. <clears throat> Devil's a lie, He's trying to steal my voice, but he ain't going to have it. Psalm eleven, verse three. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? There are foundations in almost everything that we do in every, every place we live. Every, every, every facet of life, there's always foundations. What you build on, what you build your life on, how you begin, there's a foundation of education. You don't take a five-year-old and stick them in high school. Because a five-year-old won't have any idea. He has not reached the level of maturity to understand. So there's a foundation that's being built. And it, it doesn't work in a, a lot of times in the United States. Because all they're worried about is passing students through. They could care less whether they know anything. And that's not the kind of foundation that God had intended in learning, education. God, we start out, first of all, in kindergarten. Then we go to first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, all the way up to college. <clears throat> There's foundations in your life. What you eat, what you do, where you go. There's foundations in relationship with Jesus Christ. And if that foundation be destroyed, what will the righteous do? I'm seeing the church of Jesus in the 21st century. <clears throat> if, uh, I can't begin to tell you some of the things I'm witnessing and I'm seeing. If, if I showed you some of the things that I've been searching and seeking out of what's happening in churches today, there's, the people are jumping around like animals. Young people. And it's all the hip-hop music in the church. And they're jumping up and down all over the place, pink lights, blue lights, fog all over the place. And I said, Lord, this is a sanctuary. This is a holy place where God comes and dwells in our midst. And we've seen his power and his anointing powerfully this morning. It must be a place of respect and honor. Amen. Let me tell you something. You would not take those same kids and go to the U.S. Capitol and do that. It wouldn't be allowed. It wouldn't be allowed in the library. It wouldn't be allowed some places in public. Why do we allow it in God's house? Well, the reason why we want it in God's house is because we need to entertain people. But I want you to know that God's not into the business of entertaining people. How are the foundations... Uh, how the foundations can be destroyed and what, can, what constitutes its demise. I'll say that again. 
My first point is how the foundation can be destroyed and what cons what cons <clears throat> my throat, I don't know what's going on here. And what constitutes its demise? What you got? Oh, thank you. Hallelujah. See if that works. How the foundation can be destroyed and what constitutes its demise. These two things, there's many things, but I focused on two things. Number one, foundations can be destroyed by ignorance. Let me explain that to you. Have you ever, have you ever had anybody in your life come to you and try to tell you something that they have absolutely no wisdom or no knowledge about? And you do? And everything that they're telling you is opposite of what you know is to be true. Isn't that right? Now, if I can use this as an example, if I can. Uh, let's see, who can I pick on today? I'm going to pick on Mark because I know Mark has this one area of his life. Many of you may, not, may know or may not know that he has, he's a, a sensei. Is that right? that he has a fifth degree black belt in karate. And it would be absolutely foolish for me to go to him and start to tell him what stances are right, what stances are wrong, which hand movements are right, which hand movements are wrong. I can go to him in ignorance and you know what, he'll probably just smile and say, well, you need a little more training. But that's what's happening in the church. Okay. I I go to this prayer meeting on Thursdays, and um, one of the one of the pastor. Uh, I'm gonna take that back. She's not a pastor. I don't believe in women pastors. But the sister in the Lord, she's very sincere. She really is. She has a sin sincere heart, but she's wrong. And she puts all her hope and her trust in these prophets from Kansas City. If any of you know about the Kansas City prophets, research it. You'll see. And these prophets are supposed to be the ones and these apostles, new apostolic anointing and new prophetic movement that's happening in America. And I want you to know that maybe some of the things that they may say is true, but a lot of what they're saying is not true. These are the same ones, same prophets that this girl, this lady looks up to, okay, that anointed Todd Bentley as an apostle that anointed him as the, the, the next apostle Paul, if you will, that anointed him, there was like 15 of them, I guess 10 or 15 of them, that all spoke words of him that he was going to have God's favor and all. And if you don't know Todd Bentley, he was the one that was in charge of the Lakeland revival that took place. And God TV emptied all of their programming to cover this live He's the one that has tattoos all over his arms and all kinds of things. And they, he went before them and they said, you're the next, you're the next evangelist of America and blah, 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 blah. But they didn't know that two weeks after that, he divorced his wife and married his all-time girlfriend. That he'd been cheating on his wife. Well, you know what that did to the Lakeland Revival? My question is, with these prophets, what happened to their discernment? But yet they're being raised up as being some of the greatest voices in America. Let me say this to you. Let me say this to you. I've been in this for 30 years. I've been in Pentecost for 30 years. And I believe I have this much of my opinion over you. Just this much. Because I have the experience. So before you criticize me, before you talk about me, sit down with what you know and come and talk with me. And I'm saying this on the CD too, so anybody that's listening. What I'm telling you is the truth. If you don't like the truth, well, I'm sorry. I don't mean to offend you, but I'm telling you the truth because I've been studying this word for 30 years and I see things happening that are not according to the word of God.
So how can the foundation be destroyed? It can be destroyed through ignorance. There are people that are doing things in the name of Jesus, in the name of God, that don't have a clue. They, they, they think they're doing the right thing, and I, and I understand there's people that are innocent, that they don't understand these things. However, I believe that God will raise up people, especially in the congregation, or in leadership, to go address the wrong that needs to be corrected. So if people are preaching or teaching wrong doctrine, they need to be corrected. They need to be told, but not told in a way where that will destroy their faith. Because there's so much out there going on. But one of the ways that the foundation can be destroyed and has been destroyed in America is through ignorance. Well, what is that ignorance? Well, the Bible tells us in, in Timothy... To study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So when Paul the Apostle was writing that under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and he said, rightly dividing the word of truth, there also, that also may mean that there's a way to not divide the word. There's a way to rightly divide, and there's a way to wrongly divide it. And what happens a lot of times is people, when they're trying to interpret the Bible, they look at the Bible and they start interpreting it according to what they experience, what's called subjective. What is subjective? It's what they feel, what they think. Well, I think this. That's like me going to Mark and telling him, well, I think karate should be this way. And he's going to say to me, listen, I've been doing this for 30 years and it doesn't go that way. Now, either I can submit to that and say, you know what? I'm wrong, you're right. And it's not about me being wrong or him being right. It's what's right. And in the same way with the teachings in the church, we need to take the teachings of the church to the scriptures, and if it doesn't line up to the scriptures, if what's being done in the church is not lining up, we need to change it. So see, what happens is a lot of times I hear people say this all the time. And I, as I was at the prayer meeting, and I have to bring this up because I'm, I'm experiencing this. When I was at the prayer meeting, this woman said this in the prayer. She said, God, God, you know, come, come, Holy Spirit, 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 come, Holy Spirit. I felt like yelling out, he's already here. He's omnipresent. He doesn't have to come again. He's already here. The problem isn't with the Holy Spirit. The problem's with us. The problem isn't that he isn't manifesting himself. He's here. The problem is we're not sensing him because we have things in our life that push him away. And she said, God, and she was speaking, quote, prophetically, unquote. She said, there's going to be greater revelation given to the church such as never before, even to the apostles. That's not true. If that's true, then I want to see some of these apostles getting beaten. I want to see some of these apostles thrown in jail. I want to see some of these apostles, like Paul, beaten three times with whips, thrown into prison stoned almost to death three times. See, with revelation comes a thorn in the flesh. But these are the things that are coming down the pike. These are the things that are eroding the, the, the very foundation of Christianity in America. And I felt like God wanted me to say this this morning to get you aware of what's happening. Subjectively, she's saying subjectively, God's going to give us a revelation such as never before. But I would say to you, and I'm just going to borrow this for a minute because it's closer. Subjectively, inside must line up with the objective, what you can see right here. This is the instruction manual. This is what we have. And so whatever God speaks to us in here has to be in here. Now, my question to this lady would be this. There are 66 books here of Revelation. Have you mastered every single one of them? 
do you know all there is to know in this word? She's going to answer no. Then why would God give you new revelation when you haven't even done this yet? There's so much in the book of Revelation we haven't even understood. There's so much more to learn. I've been doing this 30 years and I'm still learning. But this is the objective word of God. And anything subjective must line up with this object, objective word of God. Thank you. So we see that it can be through ignorance. But foundations can be also destroyed by intentional deception. By intentional deception. Put up on the screen for me, Brother uh, Tom, 2 Corinthians 2.17. He says, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. There are those who corrupt God's word. Lack of training, lack of understanding, lack of teaching, being taught. Many today that want to be pastors don't even have a glimpse of theological training. One of the first things I ask people that don't believe in the Trinity. One of the things I ask them is, do you understand the hypostatic union of Christ in his nature? They look at me with two, like I got two heads. What in the world does he mean? Well, if you haven't had any theological training, you will not understand that. And you'll get confused and you begin to teach heresy. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, we speak we in Christ. In sincerity, you've got to be sincere. You've got to see that some of these preachers out there that are intentionally deceiving you. How do we know that? Watch, I'll show you. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. He says, the apostle Paul says here, for such are what? Pseudo, pseudo in the Greek, pseudo apostolos. For such are false apostles. Who's an apostle? If you know the meaning of the word apostle in the Greek, it means one who is sent. One who is on a divine commission. One who is sent. For we see such are false apostles. How many times you hear these preachers saying, God told me, God told me, God, I'm doing this for God. God sent me. Where are they? Churches that I've seen and, and uh, talked to people about that started out with uh, 10 or 15, and within two years they were up to 5,000 people, had a huge sanctuary, huge school, kindergarten through high school. Only the last five years, and now the building is empty and sold. There's one right here in, in um, Rhode Island. Church had over eight, uh, 1,200 people, I believe, at one time. Pastor fell into sin. They just sold the building to some construction company. Huge sanctuary, beautiful. I'm not saying he was a false apostle, the pastor. No, I'm not saying that. But there are those who say they are sent. And there are those who just went. They just did it on their own. For such a false apostles, false those that were sent, but they weren't sent by God. There are those television preachers. Listen to me. I'm not judging them. I'm exposing them. Wow. 
For such are false apostles. They are saying they are sent by God, but they're not. Deceitful workers. They have an ulterior motive. This is their motive. Right here, when I'm holding my hand. Money. They no longer look at you as a person or someone who is part of the body of Christ. They look at you as merchandise. For the Bible says in the last days, men shall make merchandise of you. All you are to them is a dollar. All, you are, all they care about is making money. You say, well, Pastor, you have nice things. That's right, I worked for them. I had a, a full-time job. I worked 40 hours and did this church on the side. Never have I taken a salary from this church yet. But you drive nice cars. Who's paid for your cars? The church must have paid for your cars. No, the church didn't pay for my cars. Both of my cars are paid in full, by the way. Not by church money, but through inheritance that Linda got. Just in case anybody's out there wants to know. I still, I'm, I'm telling you, we've been in this ministry now for what, 12, 13, 14 years? You tell me what pastor's going to stay on for 14 years without a salary. What pastor's willing to go work with his hands to supplement the ministry? That's exactly what the Apostle Paul did. He was a tent maker. And he did that. And there was a time that he didn't do that when he was in prison. He couldn't. And the church just supported him. Deceitful workers. Look at this. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Transforming themselves into those who are sent of Christ. Christ did not send them. They went in the, as saying that Christ sent them, but he never sent them. So there's intentional deceivers. Next verse, please. And don't you marvel at this. Don't be surprised by this. For Satan himself is what? Into what? What's the name? What's an angel? If you look up the Greek word angelos in the Greek, it means messenger. It's a messenger. What does a messenger do? She has a message. So don't be surprised that Satan himself can be transformed into a messenger, someone who has a message of what? Light. More visions and dreams are coming out. You watch. Watch what I'm telling you. Unscriptural. And if you don't know the word of God, you're going to be fooled. Oh, I was walking down the street and all of a sudden this light just shined upon me. And in that light, I was carried up into heaven. And I sat with Jesus on, on, on a chair with him. And, you know, after all, you know, when I got there, Jesus kind of looked depressed. So I put my arm around Jesus, and I asked him, why are you so depressed, Jesus? And he said, because of the condition of the body. And he said, is it all right if I pray for you, Jesus? And he says, I knew, I knew it was Jesus who was depressed because I knew it wasn't me. His name is Jesse Duplantis. I talked with Brother Diamond about this. He, and he's from Baton Rouge, too, this guy, Jesse DePlantis. Right from Baton Rouge. Brother Diamond calls him a pillhead. <laughs> liar. He's a liar. I said, Brother David, kind of be a little, you know, be a little easy, you know. <laughs> no, no, he's a, he's a liar. Bonafide lying, went to heaven, sat with Jesus. Jesus was depressed. That's a lie. 
But you know how many people believe that? Can I tell you my Bible says that God dwelleth in unapproachable light? In Timothy? The Apostle Paul could not even go into the light of, the, of who he was. It says it knocked him to the ground. Oh, no, but this guy just walked right in the presence of God. Yeah, it was a God, but not the God. Next verse, please. I hope I can finish this message. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers be also transformed. Whoa, 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 whoa. Satan has ministers? Huh. Therefore, it is no great thing if his, Satan's ministers also be transformed as ministers of what? Oh. Huh. Ministers of righteousness. Hmm. Whose end shall be according to their what? You got it. What is the main source behind false doctrine? What is the main what is the main source behind false doctrine? 1 John chapter 4 verse 6. 1 John chapter 4 verse 6. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. Hello. He that is not of God doesn't hear us. Hereby we know the spirit of truth and what? There is a spirit, an entity, who is alive, who thinks, who moves, who influences, and he's known as a spirit of error. What happens is when these people read into the word of God what they want because they have an agenda. And they say the word of God means this when it actually does not mean that. You can't get that from the original Greek. And they put, they put their meaning in it which changes the whole historical meaning. Guess what? If you are, that, if you are a person that does that, you are under the influence of evil spirits, of a spirit of error. Hello? That's why it is such an awesome responsibility to interpreting this word. Just don't take it lightly because you study one commentary. Hello? I have several thousands of dollars of commentaries. I'm not an opposer of commentaries. But if the commentary does not go along with this word, it's just that, a comment. And I take it as such. People not willing to correctly interpret the Bible and for various reasons and motives, they turn away from the truth by mixing subjective truth with objective truth. That's what I was telling you. Well, you see, the Lord showed me. I was reading and all of a sudden I got this revelation. And I'm speaking out this revelation. Really? I had a brother one time tell me this. I had to laugh my head off. And he believed this. I don't know if he still believes it now, but he did believe it one time. Now listen to how stupid this is. He said that he believed that every Christian should have a new car. He said, I believe every Christian should have a new car because the Bible says so. I said, really, what does it say so? He said, see, it says right here that Jesus rode on a donkey that no one ever rode on, so we all should have new cars. <laughs> now, we're laughing at that, but this, this brother really believed that. Because Jesus rode on a donkey that nobody rode in. He said, we should all have new cars. Because you know, nobody rides in, you know, everybody rides in a new car, you know. Nobody's rode in it. Nobody's owned it. Now, now, that is the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. I laughed so hard. So I said, well, then, if we take that to the end of its conclusion, 
The Bible says that Jesus had no place to rest his head, so you should be living out on the street. Hello? See, there's a thing called balance in the Word of God. Balance. How do we combat against such high treason of doctrinal error? Oh, I'm telling you. Uh, when I go to these meetings and I hear these pastors, some of them, most of them are okay. okay? But I hear some of them talk. I shake my head and I say, man, you're supposed to be a pastor. How can you think that way? You know why they think that way? Because if they think the right way, you're not going to have many people. If you preach the truth, you're not going to have many people. Because see, truth that goes in the inner parts of man, not just the intellectual part. You know, you got Peter, the apostle, man of God, comes to Jesus. Jesus, I love you. Thank you, Peter. Jesus, I'll stand with you. Thank you, Peter. Jesus, I'll die for you. I'm here. I'm with you, Jesus. Jesus said, that's good, Peter. You just keep on believing that, Peter. No, he didn't say that. What did he say, Peter? Peter, before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. Oh, when Jesus said to his disciples, I'm preparing myself to go to Jerusalem to be crucified, Peter stepped in and said, oh, no, no, Lord, no, no, not, no, not you, Lord. Mm -mm. Not you, Lord, that ain't going to happen to you. No, we won't let that happen to you. There's natural revelation, there's natural anticipation, there's natural conclusions, but if it doesn't line up with what God's word says, we can't go by that. Because uh, there, there are people that believe that God is an alien. How many, how many, let me ask you a question. How many people believe that God is in everything? How many people believe that? You raise your hand. Anybody else believe that God is in everything? God is not in everything. That's called pantheism. That means if God is in everything, then everything is God. That means the rock is God, the river is God, nature is God. No, that's pantheism. We don't believe that. He is the God of creation. See, if he's the God of everything and he's nature and creation, then guess what? Nature and creation in the universe had a beginning. So if it had a beginning, then how did God come into existence? See, the the point is this, that God is not his creation. He is the father of creation, but he existed long before anything came into existence, before the universe was, was made. We can't understand that because we're people that dwell, dwell with time. We, we're used to time. We only have so much time. But when we understand God, that God is infinite, he's everlasting. He is so greater than what we could even imagine or think in our little... I don't care if you're the greatest professor with the five PhDs after your name. You'll still not be able to fully comprehend who God is. Neither will I. But there's a spirit of error that wants to get a hold of us. How do we combat against this high treason of doctrinal error? Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. To four. I'm going to read that for you. I'm almost kind of skipping over a little bit. I had a lot more, but. Paul was a pastor. I mean, uh, Timothy was a pastor. Timothy was the pastor of the church of Ephesus. So when you read the book of Ephesians, Timothy was the pastor. And here the Apostle Paul, he's, he's 
speaking to Peter, um, she's speaking to um, Timothy. And he gives Timothy, Timothy was a very timid person. Remember Paul told him, Timothy, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Well, he didn't just say that. It was because Timothy battled some of these things. He had a, he had a very timid spirit. And he was saying, God's not giving you a spirit of timidity, a spirit of fear, but he's giving you a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. In other words, all the things that sometimes pastors question, whether they're loved, whether he's really thinking clearly, what are we teaching? Is we really teaching the truth here? You know, you start to wonder. Because what happens is sometimes when we don't see results in the natural, we kind of question. And it's a good thing. Because you begin to question, you know, Lord, is something going on? What's going on? Whatever. God not giving him, giving him a spirit of fear, of power, of, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. And he says to Timothy here, he says, Preach your feelings. Preach your subjective revelations. Preach your prophetic word. Preach what other people want you to preach. Preach what's popular. What does he say? Preach the word. Preach. That's a, that's a command, by the way. That's not a suggestion. It's a present imperative. Preach the word. It's a command. Be instant, in season, and out of season. In other words, be ready to preach the word. When it's convenient, when it's not convenient. Preach the word when you have a word to speak to somebody. Preach that word without fear of their faces or what the retaliation would do to you. Preach the word. You know, there are Christians all over the world that will preach the gospel, and the minute, the minute they open their mouth, they're shot dead. It's happening all over the world, whether you believe that or not. It is true. There are Christians right now that are thrown into prison for preaching the gospel. Does it stop them? No. I read about the Apostle Paul and I read about Peter and all those. They went out and preached the gospel. Some of them got stoned, got beaten up, cast out of the city. You know what they did? They went to a house, got a little bit of healing, went right back to the same city and preached. Those people are crazy. What's wrong with those people? God delivered them. They got a way out. No. It doesn't change the mandate. I have a friend who's a very intellectual person. I would say... Pretty close, there's not probably anyone here that's probably as smart as he is. Maybe, maybe Leo. But he's got a PhD, not a PhD, he's, got, he's working for his master's at Harvard University. Very educated in uh, physics. Smart. And then he asked me a question one time, and I said, well, let me ask you something. Let me ask you a question. I said... If you knew something was a lie, would you give your life for it? It's Joe Fabio. I don't know if you remember Joe Fabio. So would you give your life for it? I said, and you knew subjectively, inwardly. You knew that it was a lie. You did, it wasn't true. Would you give your life for it? He said, no. I said, well, look at all the disciples in the Bible that were martyred, were killed. If what they were teaching was not the truth and they didn't really believe it was the truth, why did they give their life up? He said this to me. He says, I never thought about that. See, the reason why is that we speak the truth in love. We speak the truth, but we have to speak the truth because if we don't speak the truth, there's a spirit of error that will take over a person's mind. Okay, sometimes people are saying things and they have not a clue. How many of you ever ran into a person that says this to you. I don't believe the Bible because there's contradictions in it. <clears throat> Anyone ever run into people like that? <clears throat> you know what I did? Someone told me that one time. They said, I don't believe the Bible. I don't read the Bible because there's contradictions in it. So I took the Bible and I handed it to him. I said, could you please show me one? That's right. He just stared at me like you're staring at me. Please show me a contradiction, please, in the Bible. Well, you know, in the Bible it says about the angel in the, at the tomb, there was one, Luke, I think it was Luke said he saw two angels and Matthew saw only one angel. See, that's a contradiction. I said, no, it's not. 
If you, say, if you have a car accident and you, interv and you interview the witnesses, you're going to get a different story, but it's going to mean the same thing. The accident happened and who's at fault? But you, one may have an attention on this particular aspect of the accident, and another may have another. Might be looking at the people, how they were, if they were injured. The same way, when, Mark wrote, or when Matthew wrote about the angel saw one, that's what he recorded. And Luke saw two. It's not a contradiction of, of truth. They just wrote from different aspects. Oh, come on. Will you stop going so fast, clock? How do we know what foundation is right for the building on the 21st century church? Number one, we must identify the architect and review the blueprints for the foundation. Who's the architect? I'm, I'm not going to turn to the, to the uh, reference, but I'll tell you what the reference is. See, the architect who built the church is not Judaism. The architect that built the church is not the Roman Catholic Church. In Matthew, Jesus said these words. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. Amen. See, I got to get to these scriptures because I don't want to miss these scriptures. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 16 says this. We can see the primary blueprint for the foundation in this scripture. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 16. Lord, in trouble they had visited thee. They poured out prayer when thy chastening was upon them. Let me make sure I got the right, the right verse here. Huh? Yes, there it goes. Isaiah 28, 16. What did I say? 26? 28, 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord. You want to hear God speak? How many want to hear God speak? You just heard him speak. It wasn't me. It's his word. Don't separate God from his word. Somebody say, oh, if I could only hear the voice of God. Open your Bible. Therefore, thus says the Lord, God. Which one is that? Is that the prophets of Baal? No. Is that some foreign god? No. Is that some statue somebody made in a factory and painted gold and blue and pink on it and made a, a, a figure of it and put it up on a platform and everybody worshiped? No. That's so stupid. Think about it. To go somewhere and make a, make a, make a, a mold and pour some plaster in it and make an image... And paint it all colors and put it up on a platform and worship it. Well, who's the creator of it? So you're, you're worshiping the creature rather than the creator. Hello? And they call us stupid. And here they are in a corner talking to a statue into a stone. Oh, Mary, you've got to do this for me. Please, Mary. Please. Mm. They're talking to an inanimate object. But yet they're the old, they're holy old, they're the ones that are really, they're the ones, oh, that's the church. No, it isn't. He said, behold, I lay. In other words, behold, take notice, please pay attention. This is what God is saying. I lay, God, he does it. He lays in Zion, which is Israel, but which is the church too. I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone. It's not just a stone that's just... Now understand when I'm speaking of this, this is symbolic. It's not literal, it's symbolic. A tried stone, when it's been tried in the fire. A precious stone cornerstone a sure 
foundation. And he that believeth shall not make haste. God is the initiator. God is the one who set this foundation. And shame on any preacher or any pastor or any so-called prophet that tries to remove that foundation to build upon something else. I got to go. I got to hurry up. Uh, I'm telling you, I got all this stuff here. There is another part of the foundation. Well, let me go back for a moment. We see Jesus as the sure foundation that we need. And it refers not only to his person, but his life, his teaching, his rebukes, his instruction, his correction, his admonition, his obedience to his heavenly father. We cannot decide to make or do what Jesus said or did irrelevant to the proper instruction given by him in keeping a proper foundation. You cannot ignore what Jesus said, what he taught, what he did. And build a foundation apart from that. That's why I, I say this. And people don't agree with me, but they have no backing of scripture. I don't believe in woman pastors. It's not because I'm a bigot. It's not because I think women are stupid. I don't believe men are more intelligent than women. That's not the issue. The issue is here. Let's look at the pattern, how God did it. When God did it, did he do it? Find it in here. Show me the apostolic succession of laying on of hands and appointing a woman pastor. Show me one woman apostle. Show me one woman who wrote one of these books in the Bible. I had someone say, well, it's the book of Ruth, you know. Yeah, but Ruth didn't write the book. Hello? When Jesus went up to a mountain to pray, he went to get the Father's will. He says, everything I do and say is the Father's will, right? He went up to a mountain and pray, and he came down. It says he chose 12 men. Why didn't he chose a woman? So we have what Jesus did. We have what the apostles did. We have the foundation that he made. So why in the world are church ordaining women to be pastors? And the reason is because they don't have enough men. And that's the excuse they use. Well, we don't have enough men. That's a lie. The men that God wants to choose, you don't want. Because he'll put you in your place. Wait, women have a place? Yeah, they do. They have a wonderful place. A glorious place that God has ordained for them. But they're not happy with that. So they go out and they get some church to back them up and they get ordained. Where is that in the scriptures? If this is the, if this is the foundation of our faith, if this is where we get all of our instruction and information from, then where is it in here? It's taken from scriptures out of context. And I don't want to jump on that because I've got, got a couple more scriptures I want to share, please. Lord, help me here. Now listen to me. Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus being the chief corner stone. What was the foundation of the apostles and prophets? Well, see, in the Bible it says there was a separate foundation from the foundation of Jesus. So, you know, we have to go by the apostles. You know, there's actually a church out there that they throw everything out in the Bible except for what Paul wrote. Well, because we're under the dispensation of grace, you know, and Paul was the only one that wrote about grace, so therefore we only obey his teachings. When it says built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, meaning who were they representing? Who sent them? Jesus Christ, who is the chief cornerstone, who solidifies everything. 
and to stay upon that foundation. Verse 21. In whom all the building fitly framed together grows up into a holy temple in the Lord. God wants us to be a holy temple, but on a right foundation. Do you know that many scholars believe that when the foundation was laid in any temple, even in the pagan temples, it cost them their firstborn son. That was a, that was a ritual that they did. When they would build a temple, there's one in First Kings I could read it to you, but I'm not going to. I don't have time. But whenever there was a dedication of a foreign god or whatever temple, they would always give their firstborn son to that god. But look at our God. He showed up every single one of them. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my firstborn son, my only son. And I'm going to sacrifice him. But not only, will it, not only will it endure to the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of generations, but he shall bring new life. Amen. I'll tell you the love of God that he has for us. Psalm 118 verse 22 says, The stone which the builders refused to become has become the headstone or the corner. The stone which the builders refused, that was Israel, they refused to build it. They refused. They refused. What happens when the foundation gets corrupt? I'm going to show you. There's only one foundation and no other one should be built. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. I'm going to conclude with that. 1 Corinthians 3, 11. 1 Corinthians 3, 11. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. He's the one you can trust. He's the one that you can depend on. He's the one that will never leave you. The cornerstone is always there. It's always there. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is what? Jesus Christ. Remember what I'm telling you. The Bible says in Matthew, says, Lo, in the last days men shall come saying, Here is Christ, or there is Christ. I counted some like 23 Christs all over the world today that are living that claim to be Christ. There's one guy in Australia. There's a guy in uh, uh, Puerto Rico. There's a guy here in the United States, and there's many, many more that claim to be Jesus, the Messiah. I'm telling you, actually believe that they're Jesus. I said, well, if you're Jesus, then you can't die anymore, right? I'd take a shotgun out and blow his head off and see what happens. Believe me, you do that, they won't be Jesus much longer. See, the deceivers, because they're not Jesus. Next verse, please. I got to go. Come on. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. So there's a way that to, you can build on this foundation. There's three aspects of building on this foundation. There's what? Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Different materials, right? If you look at wood, hay, and stubble, if you look at typology, anything that has to do with any kind of wood or straw or stubble or, or hay or anything like that resembles human, humanity. Anything that with precious stones, gold, or silver has to do with divinity. So a man can build on this foundation out of his humanism, of what he thinks. He can build on this foundation wood, hay, and stubble, or he can build it God's way. Um, let me put it simple this way. He can build it God's way or their way. There's two ways to build. God's way or their way. Verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. You can believe in some of the foolishness that's going around in churches today, these fire tunnels. 
people passing through, people laying hands on them, and they're falling all over the place, laughing all over the place. My, my question is, what's the purpose? And they got people laying hands on people that shouldn't be laying hands on people. It's for show. It's, they got to have an entertaining spirit. Because if you don't have things to entertain people today, you know what they do? They'll go somewhere else. They need to be entertained. Hello? See, there's a difference between singing for the Lord. Like Sunamita sang a song as unto the Lord. And that comes out of a heart of worship. It comes out of a heart of, of dedication. It comes out of a heart of consecration. Versus somebody just getting up to sing a song so they can have applause and recognition and all that other stuff. And I know none of that stuff is in Sunamita. But no foundation can any man lay that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. So in conclusion, let's summarize. Number one, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Number two, how do we combat against such high treason of doctrinal error? We've got to rightly divide the word of truth. I spoke that before. You need to rightly divide the truth. Rightly. You can build wood, hay, or stubble or precious stones. My heart's desire is the precious stones of God to build this ministry the way God wants it, not the way that I think it should be run. To build it the way that God intended it to be in holiness and righteousness and purity, setting the example for you to make you a church without spot or wrinkle to present you before the Lord at his coming because he's coming soon. Amen. Now, don't get all caught up in that and this, well, God's coming soon. I'll quit my job. You know, that's what they did in the Bible. That's stupid because if a man doesn't work, he don't eat. See, you can't take one part of the scripture without balancing it out. What did Jesus say to do? Occupy till I come. See, if we take the whole scripture, not just one scripture, well, I might as well just, you know, Curl up and not do anything because Jesus is coming back. No. You plan your life. You do what you want. You, you know, you do what God wants you to do. You live your life in godliness and holiness to, to the Lord. You pray and ask God for direction. And he'll give you direction. For other foundation can no man lay than which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Be prepared because a lot of stuff's coming down the road. Be prepared. You heard it here. No foundation. Don't let anybody ever tell you anything different. You hold firm to the faith that was once established for the faith. And in Jude, it says this in the book of Jude, earnestly contending for the faith. That means fight. A contending is fighting. Earnestly fighting for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. I'm not interested in what this 21st century church and, and all this uh, glamour and all this stuff and big fancy buildings I'm not interested in that I'm interested in building lives Amen. so can we pray can we pray for the church can we pray father we pray for your church we pray father that it would get back to the roots that you had intended we pray father God that you said that Jesus would build the church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it my question is, why is the gates of hell prevailing against it? It's because he's not built the church. Wood, hay, and stubble burns. Precious stones don't. They'll last through the fire. All that's wood, hay, and stubble is what can be seen by man. But the precious stones are buried deep, hidden. Not for the man's applaud. For you cannot be a pleaser of God and a pleaser of man. And so, Father, we thank you and we praise you today. And I pray that you be with your people, surround them with your angels, and protect them, Lord. Help them to be good students of your word. Help them to apply the word of God to their life and to remain steadfast, unmovable, unshakable on your word. And I pray for their families, Lord. I pray that you give them blessings, that you would help them with their struggles and their pain and the sorrow that they go through. 